Have you ever wondered how hip-hop in Toronto went from letting your backbone slide to sliding on the ops block? If you know anything about old-school Canadian hip-hop, you'll know it wasn't exactly the voice of the streets in Toronto at the time. Here we go, are you ready for one other? Dream Warriors noise is new discover all. So what changed? How did it get from this... Okay, party people in the house. May I attention, please? In a moment. ...to this... I told her that I love her just to fuck her. If you try and set me up, I have to dust her. Well, first of all, we have to understand what Canadian labels were trying to push at the time. Canada has had a history of being 10 years behind America when it comes to popular music. And with hip-hop being so fresh and new in the 80s, we wanted to get on the cusp of what was cool at the time. Even if what was cool at the time kind of sounded like this. Well, I went to the hat store today and I bought myself a hat. <laughs> Toronto artists actually started to receive some mainstream success at this point. Maestro Fresh West's debut album almost went double platinum in Canada, and the Dream Warriors managed to peak at number 24 on the US alternative charts. It seemed like nobody could stop the small but emerging Canadian hip-hop market. The next 15 or so years saw popular Canadian artists such as Chalk Claire, Cardinal, Shad, and Drake come to light. Although Drizzy got signed by an American label, the city still loved him early on. However, even the OVO rapper himself wasn't rapping about the streets until much later. And now a word from our sponsors. Have you ever seen an ad for Raid Shadow Legends and thought, man, what is this game? Well, I'm here to tell you it's actually a pretty good game. So the good people at Raid hit me up and said, you know what, just try the game, let us know what you think. So I said, alright, bet. And I got the game. And it's actually one of the most complex mobile games around. So let's dive right into the gameplay. Basically, you have these champions you use to fight through sets of guards trying to topple some castles. I made it to the end of one of the first castles in the campaign mode. Basically, you have to get past all the guards before you fight the main knight. He ended up killing one of my champions, but my boys managed to murk him with hardly a scratch. The dark bolt attack my boy Kale was using came super clutch at the end. So there's a lot of stuff being added to the game, and I'll just dive right into that. First, they just added champion fragments. Basically, that lets you collect pieces of champions that you can use to summon specific champions, and there's special events running all the time with this. There's also a new bazaar where you can load up on high value items with the gold bars you win in Tag Arena, and they just extended the daily login rewards to 270 days with free champions available just for logging in. It's been a crazy month for updates, so there's never been a better time to start. You could find me in game under the name Tom Has Money. If you're quick enough, you can join my clan and we can slide on some castles together. Go to the video description, click on the special links, and if you're a new player, you'll get 50,000 silver, 50 gems, 1 energy refill, 1 clan boss key, 5 mystery shards, 1 day XP booster, and 1 free champion, the Executioner. All that treasure is going to be waiting for you for the next 30 days, so get on it. What Canada had seemed to completely miss was the rise of gangster rap in the mid-90s. Not only was this type of hip-hop more fresh than what was coming out in Canada, but it took the world by storm. Soon there would be classic albums seemingly coming from everywhere, including The Chronic, Doggy Style, Enter the Wu-Tang, and more. The wave seemed to keep going into the mid-2000s, with artists such as Jay-Z and 50 Cent rising to international fame. It seemed rap had now become more about giving the streets a voice, and Canadian labels had yet again fallen behind in the international music game. Canadian hip-hop in the mid-2000s being more popish than anything left somewhat of a void for Canadian hip-hop fans. There was all this rap about certain hoods in the US, but what about the areas such as Regent Park and Jane and Finch that we know and love? Well, lower income neighborhoods of Toronto such as Regent Park were already very active during the filming of 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying. Just remember the classic story of DMX getting robbed in Regent Park. Artists such as Genghis Kong and Dusty Wallace started to rise to prominence during these times. However, the sound was much different than it is now. This music was still on the fringes of Canadian pop culture, and artists such as Kanon and Cardinal Official still reign as the most popular Canadian acts, and labels love the non-threatening nature of the music. It wasn't until Roni's Imposter, where Toronto got its first taste of local viral success. The Regent Park rapper even managed to get coverage from Noisy, and it seemed like all was going up for Roni, until he got locked up for human trafficking May 8th of 2014. For the first time, everyone outside the projects in the city got a glimpse of how real Toronto hip-hop was. Canadian labels saw this as something to stay away from, and hip-hop was pushed deep into the underground after that. It was only until a few years later, where two region park kids came together and made a song about selling dope by the Rabba that took the city by storm. We still by the Rabba, Northside nigga, still moving, proud of moving lava, moving hot nigga, not rocking, proud of rocking Gucci, rocking Gucci. Because Canadian labels were nowhere to be found in terms of developing local artists talking about the harsh realities of the streets in Toronto, 
any music that came out would be very underproduced and would show off a raw view of these lower income neighborhoods. But something about how raw the songs were made them relatable to Toronto's youth. Everyone had a Rabbis Fine Foods near them somewhere, and everyone loved hearing hip hop about things they knew. Moji and Smoke Dogs still had exploded in high schools across the city. It's also important to note that Robin Banks already had a few songs out at the time, but he didn't really explode like that until he was TT in the club with his track, Club TT. Moji's witty yet street-worthy bars now being a citywide sensation got the attention of Drake, and his switching it up with the left leg Ginobili became something all of hip-hop started to love. Things were looking up for Toronto at this point. Artists such as Pressa, Puff Yells, Smoke Dog, Top 5, and 3M French were all seeing some local success talking about the street life. And Drake even took Pressa and Smoke Dog on tour with him. Moji, however, began to make it very clear that OVO wasn't paying him for his ideas that influenced Drake, and started to air him out on Instagram. He was then jumped by some goons Drizzy allegedly paid off from the West End. At this point you might be saying, this doesn't really explain how Toronto rap became about sliding on the op's block. And you're right. However, it does show how hip-hop was pushed more into the underground, and how artists started talking about their surroundings at the time. Toronto had a long history of beef between neighborhoods that I won't go into in this video, however it's important to know that hip-hop became more and more violent as it became more and more popular. Robin Banks was tragically shot and paralyzed in 2017 after almost getting signed to Meek Mill's Dream Chasers. The scene started to heat up even more as gangs from Regent Park had been in an ongoing war against gangs from Alexandra Park. It seemed each hood in Toronto had a set of gangster rappers that would publicly defend themselves and threaten other hoods through tough talk in their raps. The already boiling over Toronto scene became even more aggressive when Regent Park's Smoke Dog was shot and killed by someone from Jane and Driftwood. This sparked a huge war between Driftwood and Regent Park, and that war has been going on ever since. Fast forwarding to the present, there are numerous hoods with numerous rappers all taking pride in where they come from. It resulted in some great music coming out, but it also resulted in the tragic deaths of young rappers such as Houdini, Bully, Young Dubs, 40 Double O of Tollop Twins, and more. And it's kind of crazy that I have to say more. It gets me thinking, if Canadian labels kept their ears to the streets more, would we have less deaths in the city? It certainly wouldn't have ended decade-old beefs between neighborhoods. However, it certainly would have allowed artists from the city an escape from the harsh realities of low-income neighborhoods in Toronto. If there's a silver lining to all this, it's shown in how real Toronto music is compared to some cities in America. If you're from Toronto, it's not hard to understand exactly what each Toronto artist is talking about in each line of the song, and just how real it can get.